well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. So glad you're with us on the program today. We're going to be talking with Cody Wisniewski, uh, Vice President General Counsel of the Firearms Policy Coalition Action Foundation. Now, I will say that I sat down and had this conversation with Cody uh, yesterday. So this was before we got a great decision out of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. That happened uh, right as I was sitting down to record today's show in a case called Lara versus Evan Etchik. Uh, And this is a case dealing with gun bans for under 21, specifically carry bans for under 21s in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, there were uh, individual plaintiffs, who, again, younger than the age of 21, who under Pennsylvania law could theoretically open carry, right? You have to be 21 to get a concealed carry license in Pennsylvania, but you can open carry if you're 18 years of age, unless, unless a state of emergency exists. If a state of emergency has been declared, then only those with concealed carry licenses can lawfully carry. And again, you can't get one unless you're 21. Um, As the Third Circuit noted, for almost three years, The state of Pennsylvania existed with various states of emergencies in place. Uh, The COVID pandemic, the opioid addiction crisis, Hurricane Ida, all uh, subject to states of emergency, which meant that, again, under 21s basically had no ability to lawfully carry a firearm. And the Third Circuit notes that the Pennsylvania legislature has uh, amended its constitution. Uh, to limit the governor's authority to issue such emergency declarations to 21 days. Uh, And that subsequently ended all of the emergency declarations that were in place. But uh, the Third Circuit did not say, all right, this case is moot now. Uh, It knows, or at least the judges on the panel know, that um, another state of emergency is likely to be declared at some point in the future in Pennsylvania, and this problem is going to continue to exist. So the money quote from the Third Circuit panel here. In response to the arguments by the plaintiffs that their rights are being infringed upon, the commissioner contends that the appellants are not among the people to whom the Second Amendment applies and that the nation's history and tradition of firearm regulation support the statutory status quo. We disagree. The words the people in the Second Amendment presumptively encompasses all adult Americans, including 18 to 20 year olds. And we are aware of no founding era law that supports disarming people in that age group. Accordingly, we will reverse the district court's decision and remand the case back down to district court for a do-over in light of their findings. Again, this is a big victory. It Look, it's, it's not a final victory. It's possible that the Third Circuit could take this case on banc. Although we've actually seen some good on banc decisions out of the Third Circuit too. Range versus Garland, where the Third Circuit said that Brian Range should not be forevermore denied the ability to own a firearm uh, because of a nonviolent misdemeanor conviction decades ago that at the time was punishable by more than a year in prison. Mr. Range received probation for the offense of falsifying his income on a food stamp application. But again, because that crime was punishable by more than a year behind bars, it served as a prohibition on him lawfully keeping and bearing arms going forward. Third Circuit said that's not right. Um, So even if this case does go on bonk, that doesn't mean we're going to get a bad decision. (laughs) Uh, but we are going to be talking a lot about uh, on bonk decisions with uh, Cody um, because I had to ask him about the Fourth Circuit decision preempting uh, sort of a, a premature on bonkinization, I think was the uh, phrase that I used with Cody. The Fourth Circuit uh, deciding to take um, a challenge to Maryland's assault weapon ban, Bianchi versus Brown, on bonk more than a year after oral arguments had been held before a three judge panel. While we were waiting for that three-judge panel to issue its decision, the Fourth Circuit says, ah, you know, time out, time out. We're not going to see that decision because we're going to go ahead and hear this with the entirety of the Fourth Circuit. In fact, it wasn't the only case that the Fourth Circuit decided to take on bonk before we even had that initial three-judge panel's uh, opinion come out. Um, Rare is one word to describe it. Uh, Unusual is another word to describe the Fourth Circuit's a decision. I, there are some other letters, some other four letter words that I could use to describe it too. But um, let's kick off the conversation with Cody Business. You get his thoughts on the latest with Bianchi versus Brown and the future of Second Amendment litigation, not only in the Fourth Circuit, but around the country. Take a look and a listen. Cody, thanks so much for coming on the program. It's so good talking to you today. Of course. Happy to be here. Uh, all right. So I've got to ask. I was, I was out of pocket 
on Friday. I was sitting in a hospital with my wife when uh, I'm checking my phone and I see, you know, for over a year, I've been waiting for the Bianchi decision to come down. And I see that there's news in Bianchi and I'm excited. And then I see what the news in Bianchi is. And I had to bite my tongue so I didn't scream bad words in a uh, hospital lobby because um, that, that would be wrong. Uh, but my wife looks at me. She's like, what's going on? And I just I she doesn't really you know, she doesn't follow Second Amendment issues as closely as I did. And so I, I just had to say we got hosed. <laughs> we just got hosed by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, what was your reaction when you saw the rather than getting an opinion from a three judge panel? who heard oral arguments in December of 2022 on the uh, challenge to Maryland's ban on so-called assault weapons, instead of getting an actual decision from that three-judge panel, the Fourth Circuit says, actually, you know what? We're going to take this case on bonk. We're not going to get a three-judge uh, panel's decision. We're just going to go ahead and hear this in the entirety of the Fourth Circuit. Uh, I mean, surprise was definitely my first uh, my first reaction. And then I, in a, in a fit of optimism uh i think my next reaction was well this sets it up for the supreme court pretty damn well so it, it's certainly shocking um uh, you know i haven't really seen something like this happen it certainly hasn't happened in a second amendment case like this uh in any recent history and, and even in just broader constitutional litigation property rights litigation this is really rare it's really rare for a case to get so basically right so bianchi was remanded back to the circuit after bruin and then we filed supplemental briefs and then the case was argued and then it sat for so long. And so it's really rare to see something get remanded, rebriefed, re-argued, and then just sit. And then instead of getting an opinion or getting a remand down to the district court, just sua sponte, the court decides under its own volition that it's going to take it on bonk. That's kind of a new one. <laughs> um. Yeah, it, it is kind of a new one. Uh, I, I mean, I've been covering Second Amendment litigation for 20 years. I can't remember anything like this happening, uh, at least in our arena. And, I, you know, I, I don't know if you are in a position to uh, to speculate uh, as to why the, the, it went down this way. But I, I'm curious. I mean, I can't help but wonder, were we going to get a good decision? And a majority of Ninth Circuit judges said, well, we don't want that on the record. We don't we don't want that decision to be cited. Um, so let's go ahead and preempt this because it wasn't just Bianchi, right? They 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 also decided to take another case uh, directly on Bonk. Yeah, yeah. So the Fourth Circuit grabbed, I think it was three cases, um, which they pushed on Bonk. So I mean, there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, you know, I'm always happy to speculate and read the tea leaves with the asterisk of, <laughs> you know, you're reading tea leaves of a court, and few people right. are ever right. But it does seem like there there's a potential that there could have been either conflicting opinions coming out in several cases, a conflicting me me uh, methodology, sorry, methodology being developed by the different panels of the Fourth Circuit. And basically the en banc court just said, hey, look, we're going to take all these, we're going to decide all these Second Amendment cases together, and we're going to lay down, you know, the Fourth Circuit's uh, application of Bruin across this, across the spectrum. And so it's it's possible, could be good, could be bad, you never know. I mean, you guys, you can take a look at the Fourth Circuit and uh, draw your own conclusions on that. But it does seem like there, there might have been something going on where there may have been kind of conflicting viewpoints on panels. And the, the en banc court said, instead of just getting two or three panel opinions out and then taking them all en banc, we're just going to go en banc right from the, the get-go. It is... It's rare. Uh, it's different. The one thing I would say is, is I know a lot of people are are really frustrated by it. Um, and a lot of people are looking at it really negatively. But, you know, the kind of practical side of it is, even if we would have gotten a panel, panel opinion, it seems that the Fourth Circuit wanted to address this issue on Bonk. Yeah. The on Bonk court could have immediately vacated the panel opinion and taken it on Bonk anyway. So, you know, we might have had a, a good opinion, we might have had a bad opinion that we would have been able to look to or cite or reason from. But if the en banc court wants to hear a case, the en banc court gets to hear the case. There's nothing right. you can do about that. So it kind of, uh, you know, just fast tracked us to the uh, the full fourth circuit. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up sort of the timing of all of this, because the one I think I don't even call it a silver lining, but this shouldn't impact the timing of Bianchi getting to the Supreme Court, right? Because as you say, if if that three-judge panel had said, you know what, Maryland's law is unconstitutional, 
Well, we, I mean, we know that Maryland Attorney General Anthony Brown would have asked for that en banc review. He would not have wanted that case to go directly to the Supreme Court. We know that the Fourth Circuit would have granted that en banc review. So we probably still would be in the same position where we're in today. Um, the fact that the Fourth Circuit said, all right, we're, we're tentatively scheduling oral arguments for March. That's a good sign, right? They're not waiting until you know May or June. I'm a little concerned about how long the Fourth Circuit will hang on to their opinion, uh, given that it took you know over a year and we didn't see a, a an opinion and uh, Bianchi. Um, but the timing doesn't change. This this is one of the things that makes it so curious because I think this was going on bonk regardless. So why not? Even if there was conflicting opinions from you know different panels with these different cases, seems to me like you still want that body of opinions to to be out there so that the fourth circuit can then say all right well you know what judge a said this but judge b said that and we think judge b has the stronger argument because blah 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 blah. now you don't get any of that right now it's basically this on banc review is the the opinion of first and last resort in the fourth circuit yeah i mean that's certainly true right you don't get that kind of development through the panel opinions and then into the on banc court you know, of course, the members of the panel are part of the en banc court. Right. Um, so whatever they've been developing, writing, preparing for the panel opinions, because I, I'd assume that they've been working on it for uh, for the time that it's been pending. You know, that still is all in existence. It's possible we could see, you know, a concurrence or a dissent from some of the panel judges and know what the panel opinion or have an idea of what the panel opinion might have looked like. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, they're not, you know, they're not necessarily slowing it down yet. Um, they didn't ask for rebriefing. They're just getting additional copies of the briefs that were already filed, which of course an en banc court can ask for it to be rebriefed. You know, they've currently set argument for March. So, you know, it's entirely possible that the en banc court hears this in March and they issue an opinion over the summer, uh, which lines up nicely for, you know, next term at the Supreme Court. Again, like we dealt with at, you know, the panel phase of this, of this case, once you argue the case, there's not really much you can do to to speed the case along, to push the case along, to get an opinion. So, you know, who knows how long the en banc court will will sit and deliberate uh, and decide and write their opinion. But it uh, it seems like en banc was going to be inevitable in this case, obviously, because they granted it sua sponte. So it just kind of it does skip a step. Right. It I, You know, I acknowledge that it kind of skips that panel opinion step. But it seems like it gets us somewhere where we were going to be no matter what. Yeah, that is a um, that's a that's a that's a very optimistic way of looking at it. And, and you know, I think I, I think a very fair way of looking at it. Listen, I, you know, as you well know, Cody, I mean, it's very easy for gun owners to fall into the doom and gloom scenario every time something happens because we know that we're dealing with a right that is disfavored by so many folks in academia, in the media, in government, and in the court system, right? So when we see something like this, it is easy to jump to that conclusion of, oh, they're doing it to screw us, right? They're doing it to screw us over. Um, and so I'm glad that you kind of pointed out, well, there are some other possibilities here that might explain the admittedly incredibly rare uh, decision by the uh, Fourth Circuit to take this uh, on bank immediately. Um, now, this is obviously just, you know, one of many cases that FPC is dealing with around the country. So what are some of the other cases that are out there right now where we're either in the middle of some important briefing, you've got oral arguments uh, pending, or we're waiting on a decision to come out from a district judge or a uh, appellate panel? Yeah, I mean, the big ones that everybody's paying attention to, that everybody's been paying attention to for the past two years are our cases against the ATF. Um, so there's, a, there's several of those going on right now, right? So you've got uh, the Cargill case at the Supreme Court, which is is uh, an NCLA case, isn't one of ours, but we did, we have filed briefs in that case. Um, and so that obviously is the Trump era bump stock ban that is going to be heard by the Supreme Court. So briefs are being filed in that case, you know, as we speak. So that is going to be a huge development and seeing how the court deals with these cases against the ATF, right? Because that, that bump stock rule really kind of laid the ground for these subsequent rulemakings. It was the first time in our space that we saw the ATF really step in and really take on this administrative rulemaking function that other agencies have been doing for decades to really shift the landscape of, of you know, gun rights in the country and, and gun regulation in the country. You know, we've seen that happen in 
environmental law and property rights law and all of these other spaces for decades with the administrative state kind of taking more and more power. But, you know, that that rulemaking really kind of laid the the plan, if you will, for what then happened with, uh, you know, frames or receivers and what then happened with pistol braces. So that case being before the Supreme Court is huge. Obviously, Cargill was won its case Fifth Circuit on bunk, and it was a brilliant opinion. And so there's a really good record under that case for the Supreme Court to work from. And then we ourselves have the, you know, frame or receiver case Vanderstock. Uh, which we're currently litigating back at the district court, uh, just trying to get the court to confirm the the appropriate you know scope of relief, we would say, in the legal world, which is functionally just what the court's going to do about the fact that everybody has said that we win. Now we just need to figure out exactly what the relief looks like. Okay. And then we also have our, our pistol brace case, the mock case, which we're currently briefing uh, summary judgment at the district court. So we're getting to the full kind of merits of that case mm -hmm. up to this point we've been dealing with the you know preliminary injunction and the stay on the ATF's rule now we're getting into the full merits where we can finally you know get to the point of, of final relief in the case so those three cases are all dealing with this ATF rulemaking process obviously all different subject matters but they're all kind of percolating through the court and they're all moving to the point where we should see action on all three of those this year. Okay. And that's, I mean, as you say, this is huge because the bump stock ban did open the door, I, I think, for all of these additional um, administrative actions. And frankly, I mean, I, we know that more is coming, right? They're, they're already doing this with the, uh, you know, who's engaged in the business, right? That's the uh, the latest uh, rule that's pending. Um, and, I, you know, I honestly, I mean, I'm very concerned that between now and, election day, um, we're going to see the Biden administration try to craft some other executive action, knowing that they can't get anything through Congress, but they want to be able to, you know, get the uh, uh, the uh, gun control supporters to line up behind them and turn out, you know, their base on election day. So I don't think we're out of danger in terms of seeing new uh, administrative actions coming from the ATF either. No, certainly not. I mean, generally speaking, these administrative actions take a long time. So, you know, the engaged in the business rule, they just had the proposed rule at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. They've they now have the comments. Now the next step there. <laughs> I feel like every time we talk, I'm, you know, the next step is just kind of sit and wait uh, for some of these cases. <laughs> but so comments have been submitted. So now the next step is for the agency is legally required to review every unique comment that isn't otherwise disqualified. So they have to sit and review. They have systems, they have people that do this, um, but it does take a long time. I mean, you're talking about 200,000 to 300,000 comments. Some of those are duplicative. We saw uh, somewhat unique. I, I think they, they kind of understood the commenting process on this, but the gun control organizations put out a huge call for comments on this one. And had you know a lot of comments flow in and of course they were touting the number of comments uh for and against but what they did was they basically created a mail campaign that just had somebody enter their name and hit send and it sent the exact same letter well under the administrative procedure act all the agency has to do with that is group all of those comments into one and respond to one so even though they might have sent 150,000 comments, if they're all identical for the purposes of the review, that's one comment. So the agency will sit through, we'll review all these, we'll sift all these, and then has an option. It can either craft and publish a final rule, or in other spaces, sometimes, believe it or not, the agencies just withdraw the rule. Uh, <laughs> for some reason in our world, uh, it doesn't ever seem like the agency just decides to withdraw the rule. Don't know why. But um, that'll be the next step there. So I think you'll probably we'll probably see some sort of final rule come out on the engaged in, in business rule this year. Uh, we might see some other action. But again, they take a really those agency actions uh, do rule and agency rulemakings kind of take a long time to, to percolate through. Yeah. And so it could be possible if the administration started something, let's say, in the summer, it might not be finished before the election. Right. And so right. Then there could be some, some oddity. On Time. Yeah, now, I guess I should have clarified. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see something proposed, not necessarily enacted, but to get yeah. the ball rolling. Right. Uh, which is and, you know, from from a political perspective, that kind of makes sense. Right. We're proposing this. But if you want to see us get the job done, well, you got to send me back to the White House. Um, <laughs> if yeah, Joe Biden is even coherent enough to make that statement. But uh, yeah. And, 
You know, it's fascinating, too, because while those, you know, X number of comments from the gun control groups uh, can all be lumped into one, I guess the benefit for the gun control groups is they got, you know, a bunch of new names and email addresses, right, the, for uh, for their fundraising pitches and uh, and things of that nature. So maybe that's why they didn't care about, uh, you know, crafting these individualized responses. Um, obviously, there's a lot, you know, going on in, uh, in, in your space in terms of, you know, um, the lawsuits uh, from coast to coast federal level, the state level. I'm going to ask you, you know, one of the things that we're seeing around the country right now is this constant relitigation of sensitive spaces, um, you know, where mm-hmm. where you can and cannot carry. And we're seeing this in Virginia. We're seeing this in New Mexico, uh, Washington State. It doesn't matter what a district court judge has said. Um you know, we're still seeing just these lawmakers say, no, you can't carry anywhere. I I don't care what the Supreme Court has said. Don't care what the Bruin test is. Um, You're not going to be able to carry outside of a few, you know, streets and sidewalks, maybe. So I'm curious how many of these fights that FPC is engaged in right now are, I don't want to call them duplicative in nature, but, but, but I guess maybe how much are gun control advocates sort of flooding the zone? forcing us to, you know, challenge almost identical laws in various circuit courts in order to try to protect the rights of gun owners all across the country. I mean, there is there is a lot, right? It's a it's a multi-fronted war, that's for sure. Um, the gun control organizations at, at some point recognized that, you know, federal movement is is very difficult, you know, almost impossible, right? And so now that's why it kind of shifted to this administrative space. Like we're not going to see a, a gun control law come from Congress anytime soon, right? The Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is, is about all you're going to get, which is problematic in its own right from, from its impact and was the basis for that engaged in the business rule. But there are the, the gun control organizations are also just starting to go to these kind of captured states, right? They're going to these captured states, uh, legislatures, they're providing model language for these bills, right? Some of these look identical when they come up in different states and in different cities. And they're just trying to get as much on the books as they can. So it's, you know, requiring us to file similar cases in a lot of different jurisdictions. And sometimes it's, you know, that's difficult. We have a, an active portfolio of about 57 active cases across the country. And just maintaining that much litigation is is a lot of work, even if it is on similar issues in different jurisdictions. So we're definitely seeing these these issues arise in all of these kind of captured states, the states that you would expect. But what we're also seeing is courts are uniformly striking down, you know, at least portions of these locational restrictions. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that this is going to be another big issue for the Supreme court, right? This is the natural progression from Bruin, uh, the the court said, you know, there's a, a we recognize the the right to carry in public. We recognize a broad protected right in the Constitution. However, there may be some limited exception for, you know, these locational restrictions. And now, of course, every anti-gun state in the country has has grabbed onto that little bit of language and tried to ban as much as they can. So I think it's there's a lot of these cases moving up through the courts. I wouldn't be surprised if this locational restrictions question is the next question that the Supreme Court grabs. You know, there's several things that could be. It could be these, you know, so-called assault weapons bans. It could be magazines and it could kind of be these locational restrictions. But I think all of, all three of those are, are natural follow-ons from both Heller and Bruin. And it'll be the, the one side of it is that uh, just a monologue that <laughs> the Supreme <laughs> Court likes to take on issues when there's been a lot of percolation below when lower courts have dealt with it a lot. Mm. So one impact, though, of all these states passing all of these laws is there's sensitive locations cases, these locational restrictions cases, because most of these places aren't actually sensitive. Right. Uh, in several circuits across the country, like we don't need to wait for multiple circuits to take on this issue. They're doing it right now. Yeah. So it sets it up for the Supreme Court to review it as soon as the Supreme Court is willing to grant certain one of the cases that move up there. So it's a good sign also. All right. I'm feeling a little bit more optimistic than I did when we sat down to start this conversation, Cody. I got to say, I appreciate that. And I appreciate yeah, you joining us on the program. Optimism going into this time of year. 
<laughs> well, I, absolutely. Um, all right. So listen, if folks want to be a part of the fight, they want to help fund the 57 plus lawsuits that uh, FPC has going on right now. How do they become a part of the Firearms Policy Coalition? So they can go to joinfpc.org and they can join FPC there. They can follow all of our work at firearmspolicy.org or at gun policy on just about every social media channel. Uh, of course, I work with FPC Action Foundation, which you can find at FPC Action on social media um, and online as well. And you can, you know, you can donate and support the fight there beyond just becoming a member uh, because our dues are are very reasonable and lawsuits are very expensive. <laughs> That's right. That is right. Well, listen, Cody, as always, man, really appreciate you uh, carving out a couple of minutes of your day to spend some time with us and look forward to doing this again in the very near future. Absolutely. Thanks, Cam. Thanks for having me on. My thanks to Cody for joining us on the program. And again, congratulations to the uh, FPC and SAF attorneys, as well as the individual plaintiffs here in uh, Lara versus Evanishik for their uh, victory in the Third Circuit. Right now, let's turn our attention to today's Armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. You know, I said yesterday on the program that I, I feel kind of bad going back to uh, CWB Chicago uh, on a fairly regular basis, but there's always some recidivist report that they're writing about. Uh, I feel like I'm going to the state of Minnesota almost as frequently. And not just one website, but just the state of Minnesota. Um and I guess that's because we're seeing a lot of really bad decisions coming out of the criminal justice system in the state of Minnesota, where, again, lawmakers last year decided, ah, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, this omnibus public safety bill. They said it was you know going to add more police, is going to improve the court system. And, oh, yeah, by the way, we're also going to impose some gun control laws on you, including a red flag law. Well, the red flag laws in place, I haven't seen any improvements in the criminal justice system to date because we're still seeing headlines like this. Downtown St. Paul shooting suspect was wanted for skipping two sentencings this month. Yeah, two. Um, According to the uh, Pioneer Press, 20-year-old William Anthony Mackey was wanted on warrants for skipping the hearings for violent crimes when he shot the uh, 37-year-old man in in the abdomen um, Monday afternoon. He was also on probation out of Hennepin County. Police arrested Mackey at apartments across the street from where the shooting took place. He went before Ramsey County Judge Andrew Gordon uh, yesterday and right now is being held in lieu of $250,000 bail. We'll see how long that lasts. According to police, Mackey pleaded guilty to felony threats of violence in Anoka County on October 31st uh, for firing a BB gun at an occupied car, shattering a window, sharing the occupants with glass. One person cut on the neck by the glass. Pleaded guilty again to felony, right? Threats of violence. Uh, But that plea agreement called for a stayed prison sentence and two years of of probation. He was supposed to show up for sentencing on January the 8th. He didn't. Two weeks later, he was in a Ramsey County courtroom pleading guilty to an August 22nd three charge of a felony fifth degree drug possession. Now, I don't know if Anoka County and Ramsey County don't talk to one another, but it seems to me that if you got somebody who's wanted in one county who shows up for a court hearing in another county, there should be a way to say, hey, (laughs) didn't you skip out on a hearing in that other county? Aren't you wanted in that county? We're going to hold you so that that county can take you back into custody. Apparently, that didn't happen. Apparently, that doesn't happen. Now, the uh, August 23 charge, well, again, felony, fifth degree drug possession. Um, no crime of violence necessarily attached to that, but there was, I, I think, uh, some other charges that were originally involved here. According to the criminal complaint, officers in St. Paul uh, stopped Mackey originally for riding a bike without lights at about two o'clock in the morning. Um, maybe that was just a pretext to, you know, stop and search him. When they did, they found methamphetamine and drug paraphernalia, as well as jewelry and bank cards that had been stolen from a car the night before. And inside his backpack, there was a drill, a reciprocating saw, flashlight, batteries. So certainly a lot of circumstantial evidence that Mr. Maggie was involved in some uh, burglaries of vehicles, right? But again, takes a plea deal to the drug charges. It is a felony, but a fifth-degree felony. But a felony nonetheless. And again, he was sentenced or scheduled to be sentenced to a stay of adjudication and probation on January the 10th. He didn't show up there either. Yeah. 
Um, court records show that Mackey was convicted of burglarizing a Northeast Minneapolis home in January of 2023, right? A year ago. In October of 2023, a judge stayed a 364-day sentence in the Hennepin County workhouse for two years and put him on probation. And then on December the 4th of last year, just a little more than a month ago, Mackey was convicted of misdemeanor domestic assault in Anoka County and was sentenced to 63 days in jail time, which he had already served. Now, Mr. Mackey here is not the type of individual, so far anyway, who has committed the crimes that are going to land you on the front page of the paper, right? He is, however, I think representative of the more, quote unquote, garden variety criminal, right? Someone who doesn't just commit one crime and then said, whoa, man, I made a huge mistake with my life. I'm going to turn my life around, but continues to repeat offense after offense after offense until there are consequences, until at some point he's not able to commit those offenses anymore because he's been separated from society for at least some period of time. What does it take for that to happen in Minnesota? Because, again, you've got crimes of violence that result in probation. You've got burglaries that result in probation. You've got I, now, now maybe now that he actually, you know, is accused of shooting somebody. If he's convicted or he takes a plea deal, that plea deal will involve more than two years of probation. But uh, again, I am left wondering, what does it take for a repeat offender to actually see some serious time behind bars? even after they abscond from their sentencing hearings? It's a very good question in Minnesota. Today's uh, Armed Citizen story uh, from, I believe this is uh, Washington State, the uh, Olympian, uh, with a uh, report on an armed citizen self-defense shooting that happened last week. The Thurston County Coroner's Office has released more details about the individual who was shot in that uh, self-defense shooting. Now, we don't have a lot of details about the circumstances of the shooting itself. It was about 7.50 p.m. last Thursday. Thurston County Sheriff's deputies and Tonino police were dispatched to a home after a 911 caller advised that someone had been shot. When deputies arrived, they found one person who was dead. Uh, that person identified as a 50-year-old man from Utah. The uh, county coroner says his name will not be released until his family has been contacted. Um, the coroner, though, said that the man had no ties to Thurston County, detectives interviewed the individual who shot the uh, man from Utah, as well as witnesses, were able to obtain video surveillance and reported that the shooting appears to be self-defense. The man who was shot, according to the sheriff's office, wasn't known to the involved parties or witnesses. So, again, some real confusion. I, I would love to know the circumstances surrounding this because you've got a guy with no ties to Thurston County who apparently was unknown to the armed citizen and the other witnesses who were around. So why was he there? What was he doing that led to him being shot in self-defense? So far, the Thurston County Sheriff's Office has not released that information, but hopefully we'll get some more details in the days to come. Finally today, a good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, we'll able to do the right thing. A uh, SEPTA employee who went out of his way to return a lost wallet to a man in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is not, you know, as big a deal as jumping into an icy river to save somebody after their car went off an overpass, right, like we had yesterday. But, I mean, listen, if you lost your wallet, if you've ever lost your wallet, you know, at the very least, it's a pain in the neck, right? You got to get all of your cards replaced. You got to go get a new driver's license. But you're also worried about identity theft. You're worried about people using your credit cards, using your debit cards, taking your money. It's, it's a stressful situation, to say the least. So Tuesday night, Fox 29 and uh, PA uh, reported on this story. Um, we, the, the, we, we saw a doorbell camera footage of this guy showing up at uh, the home of uh, Greg Vasily, ringing the doorbell, and uh, then leaving his wallet, but didn't really stick around, right? So now we actually know a little bit more about who did this. Who, who found the wallet and returned uh, it to uh, Greg Basile's home? Um, Don Timoney with Fox 29 said that after she ran her original story, a lot of folks reached out to her and said, oh, I know that guy. That, that's Richard. Uh, Richard Murray Day, who is a SEPTA conductor. And Wednesday night, SEPTA is the uh, public transit system in uh, the Philadelphia area. Uh, last night, Wednesday night, at the Arbor train station, Greg Basile, 
was able to thank Murray Day for going out of his way to return the lost wallet on New Year's Eve. Uh, he was on the train, Greg Basile was, from Ardmore, Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia. Murray Day found it and when he finished his work that night, New Year's Eve. So again, already got stuff going on, right? It's also Murray Day's birthday. But he decided, you know what? I got to do this. I gotta, I, I'm not even going to wait till the morning. He drove it from Doylestown, PA, to Greg's home. And again, captured on that ring doorbell camera, dropping off the wallet. Greg Basile said what he did was pretty spectacular. Well, Murray Day said what he had in there, I knew he'd really need it. And I wasn't looking for anything in return. That's just how I am and what I do. He had the next couple of days off, he said, but he didn't want to risk the wallet getting lost in the shuffle. So he drove 55 miles to Greg Basile's house. Murray Day said, I called my wife and we decided immediately that I would drive, take the wallet back to him, but to try to do it anonymously. So I'm not infringing on his privacy. Greg Basile said, uh, that is the mark of a great man that cares about people and does the right thing. And Greg Basile was so touched by the stranger's actions that he reached out to Fox 29 and said, can you help me find this good Samaritan just so I can say thank you? Um, so they ran the story. And they were able to identify the Good Samaritan. And thankfully, uh, uh, the uh, septic conductor there, Richard Murray Day, um, not looking for any attention, but uh, agreed to meet with Greg Basile. And uh, yes, the cameras were there. I don't think that was uh, Murray Day's intent. He said, at the end of the day, I did what was in my heart. Greg Basile says, I think he's a great guy. We're going to keep up this friendship. And uh, Murray Day replied, he's a great guy. Look at him. You know what I mean? So not only a lost wallet returned, but perhaps a uh, friendship started as a result of Richard Murray Day's ability uh, to uh, return that wallet again in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. I wouldn't even say it was the right time because it really was an inopportune time, but he still did the right thing. So, Richard Murray Day, we thank you for your very, very good deed. Now, that is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company, but I do look forward to being with you again on Monday of next week. And don't forget, we'll be updating BearingArms.com between now and then with all of the latest Second Amendment news and information, including, hopefully, more court victories like the one we saw today out of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, plus, Armed Citizen Stories, we've got a ton of legislative news going on right now. So make sure that you are uh, checking out the website uh, on a regular basis to get the latest news that you need to know about your right to keep and bear arms. If you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member as well. Just go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe, use the promo code GUNRIGHTS, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP or VIP Gold membership. We're going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. Is our way of saying thanks for showing your support because it really does make a difference. And we truly do appreciate it. So thank you. All right. Have a great rest of your week. We'll see you here soon. Until then, be well. Be safe and be free.